Well, thank you, thank you, thank you, praise the Lord, Mission Hall Artists, for such a beautiful song, reminding us that we are God's children living under his protection. Good morning to everyone. Good morning, church. I am tempted to ask you to turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor that God is good. At least you can do it virtually. It's a blessing to be in God's presence. It is indeed a blessing to speak to you. It's a blessing to enter into his presence with his word, with the firm and full conviction that the Lord is among us. And the word spoken will enter, will penetrate the perimeters of our hearts and lead us into a better understanding of the love of our God. This morning's sermon is entitled, can these bonds die? Did you hear? Can these bonds die? Um, you may be asking yourself, is the pastor misquoting the Bible? Can these bonds die? Because you, mo you must have heard many sermons on can this bond live? But what about can these bonds die? Is it something that, that is found in the Bible? And why are we addressing that issue today? Can these bonds die? You see, it is urgent, it's important, it's imperative that we enter into that kind of rhetoric in order for us to grasp, to be blessed by the word of God, to make the word of God relevant to our mutual existence, to our common existence, to our personal lives. So we can preach many sermons, beautiful sermons, but if the sermons do not touch our lives, if the word of God does not penetrate our lives and operate changes that will have eternal consequences, we are simply playing church. And in these days, there is no time to play church. It's a time for recuperation, time to be recalibrated, Time to be realigned with God. Time for spiritual growth. And that's why today we are going into the sermon. And I'm inviting you to read with me. The main text is found in 1st, first, first, 2nd Samuel chapter 21. 2nd Samuel 21 verses 1 to 3. Did you hear? 2nd Samuel 21. Verses 1 to 3. Then we will read also verses 13 and 14. Second Samuel chapter 21, verses 1 to 3. Then we will also read verses 13 to 14. For those of you who have it on the screen, you may proceed. Okay, I will, I will go ahead and read it. In a different version, that's okay, because I want you to read it in the version here so to, to better understand. Chapter 21 tells us that there was a famine during the reign of King David that lasted for three years. I'd like you to hear. It's a famine that lasted three years. So David asked the Lord about it. And the Lord said, the famine has come because Saul and his family are guilty of murdering the Gibeonites, the Gibeonites. You must understand that thing. The famine has come because Saul and his, and his clan, his family, are guilty of murdering the Gibeonites. So the king summoned the Gibeonites. They were not part of Israel, but were all that was left of the nation of the Amorites. Israel has sworn not to kill, but Saul, in his zeal for his nation, in his zeal for Israel and Judah, in his zeal, Saul had tried to wipe them out. David asked them, what can I do for you to make amends? Tell me so that the Lord will bless his people again. Let's stop right here, verses 1 to 3. Something is happening in the land. There was a famine. People were dying. 
the unemployment line, lines were long. There was no food bank, no soup kitchen. There was no stimulus check. The nation was in crisis. And three, the whole thing lasted three years. But it's only after the third year that David went to God. Do you understand what happened? During the first two years, it's only the poor people who are dying. Only the underprivileged were dying. The famine has not yet penetrated the palace. How selfish can we be, even if we are writing Psalms and Proverbs? Three years, on the third year, David went to God and asked God, what's wrong? And God said, the reason why the famine came into Israel, it's because of the murder, the genocide committed by Saul, the previous king. So David said to himself, what can I do to repair the error, the faults? How, how can I be amend? And that then will let us go now to verses 13 and 14. It says here, verses 13 and 14. So David brought the bones of Saul and Jonathan, as well as the bones of the men the Gibeonites had executed. He buried them all in the tomb of Kish, Saul's father, at the town of Zela in the land of Benjamin. And the Bible says in verse 14, after that, did you hear? After that, God ended the famine in the land of Israel. After David went and picked up the bones of, of Saul and Jonathan and some other men were killed. It's only after that that the famine ended. And I'm kind of troubled. Why am I troubled? The, 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 the solution seems not to fit the prescription. The prescription, the, the, the concept was the cause of the famine was because Saul had murdered the Gibeonites. And David spoke to the Gibeonites and they gave their, uh, some form of a solution. But later on, I find out that David did something totally contrary to what they had asked. And then God ended the famine. So now, I'd like you to follow me. That's very important. Could be the first time that you are, you are hearing this story. You have heard uh, the great sermon of e in Ezekiel 37, verse 3. Can these bones live? Sir, pastors have preached great sermons. People have been converted by those sermons. But here we are into another sermon that says, can these bones die? Implicitly, that's what God asked David. And I'd like to take you to the meat of the story to fully understand what is happening. David asked the Gibeonites, what can I do? Let me tell you something about the Gibeonites. For those of you who are Bible students who are interested in history, the Gibeonites were not Jews. They are not from the land of Israel. They were pagans. They met Joshua while Joshua was, the people of Israel were going to Canaan. After the great victory at Jericho, the Gibeonites heard that Israel was coming. And they heard that God was in the middle of Israel. And they said to themselves, if there is such a God who can destroy such a city like Jericho, we will not fight that God. We will submit. We will give our land to Israel. So they played a trick. They went to Joshua, and somehow they became part of Israel through conversion. Those are people who heard what God had done, what God can do, and God, what God will do. They decided to become part of God's people. But Joshua told them, do the fact that you play a trick with us 
you know, but you, we accept you. We made a covenant with, we're not gonna kill you. But you will be, you'll continue to be immigrants, but you will be carrying, you'll be cutting woods, will be woodcutters, you'll be water carriers. So the Gibeonites in Israel were the one who cut the wood for sacrifices in the temple. They cut the woods to build the homes. They did the menial jobs. They were the immigrants in Israel who basically built their cities. For 300 years, they worked as slaves, but they loved God. And came Saul, came Saul, the king, and he hated immigrants. Did you hear that? The Bible says because of his zeal for Judah and Israel, which means blind nationalism, because he loved his country, because he wanted to make Israel great again, he attacked the immigrants and murdered them and intended to decimate them, to annihilate them. And that happened almost 30 years, 30 years before the famine. Somehow, my friends, we bear the consequences of the sins of our fathers. And Israel was functioning very nicely. And God did not close his ears to the cries of the Gibeonites who were decimated by, by, by Saul because the Bible says he loved his country. There, there are so many things hidden behind nationalism that I love my country. Saul, an evil man, it seems to me that, you know, this thing sounds so familiar with, with, with us because Saul wanted to kill them. He was jealous of them. He, he just created an issue with immigration and said, we will kill the Gibeonites. And remember, they were part of the country. They were part of the service. They built the country. They cut the woods. They carried the water. And God told David, the reason why that famine came on your land is because of what Saul did to the Gibeonites. My friends, and what, what, something else I like to call your attention to. After the Gibeonites decided to become part of Israel, the neighboring countries, the kings, pagan like them, became so upset that created a coalition to attack them and to kill them. The Gibeonites became God's people. They were being attacked. They were about to be destroyed by the enemies. And the Bible says they sent message to Joshua. They said, Joshua, come to our help. We have chosen to serve God. Here, our lives are in danger. The Bible tells us that Joshua went and defended, then defended the cause, fought with them. And the kings who had attacked the Gibeonites were about to win over Israel. When Joshua, in the middle of the battle, to save the Gibeonites, lift up his head and told God and said, Son, stop! And the greatest miracle, one of the greatest miracles registered in the Bible was performed for pagans who were converted, for immigrants. The sun was stopped, as the Old Testament says. For the Gibeonites, the Red Sea was open for Israel. Joshua stopped the sun for the Gibeonites. Those were people God loves. And that's what I'm telling you, my friends. You attack the immigrants, there will be a famine in the land. <laughs> and David understood, regardless of what you did, when you did it, when you have committed the sins. And David went. And, and, and spoke with them. And the Gibeonites said that, uh, yes, King Saul wanted to kill us to the extent that we have no city in Israel where we can live in peace. He had created some evil sentiments, hatred in the country. The Gibeonites, those who had built the land 300 years, they were being killed in the streets by father and sons, just like we saw <laughs> in the south of the US. They were there. But let's try, let's go, let's go closer. They said that, the uh, Gibeonites said, the only way you can be forgiven 
is just to give us seven male descendants of the men who committed the crime. That's not a religious solution. But when you get involved in situations that are uncalled for, unacceptable by God, you end up having solutions that betray the very message you preach, unfortunately. And here we see David went and chose seven male descendants of Saul. How many? Seven. He is supposed to give them to the Gibeonites so that they, they can be hanged. The Gibeonites say that we don't want money, we don't want gold, it's just eye for eye, two photos. And the seven boys, two from a lady called Ris Rispa, and five from Merab. It was an opportunity to David to settle some score. This story is so pregnant with meaning. You see, those are Saul's children that David is giving to be murdered, to be, to be hanged or hung, but they say hanged, to be hanged. And he chose five from Merab. And for those of you who are into Bible study, Merab was the first child of Saul, whom David was supposed to marry after he killed Goliath. And Saul played a trick on him and gave him Michal, the youngest one. So now comes an opportunity for David to, ooh, to settle some score. He did not debate. He did not ask to spare the lives of those boys, of those young men. He did not say anything. He just went and chose two of Saul's children um, from, from Rispa and five from Merab, and then gave them to, to the Gibeonites, and those boys were hanged. But then I would think that once I met, I men is made, the famine would have stopped. Listen to me very carefully. Now the boys are dead, famine is stopped. That's what I thought. But the Bible says a series of other things took place before the famine stopped, before God stopped the famine. And then I went and looked into what happened. When I, when, when I saw seven kids dead, the Bible says <laughs> that the mother, that's in verse 10 of 2 Samuel 21, then Rizpa, the mother of two of the men, sp spread sackcloth on a rock and stayed there the entire harvest. She stayed there. The harvest was most, mostly in terms of time, stayed there with the dead bodies of her two children and five nephews. She sits there, and the Bible says during the day she fought. She fought the birds of prey so that the birds of prey, the vultures, would not devour the bodies of her children, her nephews. And at night, she fought wild animals. Rispa became the preserver of cadavers. That thing became a scandal in Israel. That there's a mother, mother crying over the bodies of her children, her nephews. And, and year, months passed. So they, 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 must, they must have turned into some, some skeleton. They were there, but she was fighting against bird during the day, against animals at night. And then David heard. When David heard what happened, David went, and I'd like you to listen. David went to Jabesh Gilead and took the bones of Saul and Jonathan and the bones of the seven boys and buried them, buried them in the tomb of Kish in Zela. And that's when the famine stopped. Do you understand what just happened? Not only God was addressing Saul's crimes, but there was an issue with David as well. David, 
did not kill Saul in the cave, but I believe that Saul was still in the cave of, in his heart. Because when Saul died, he did not give him proper burial. He let his bones to rot somewhere in Jabesh Gilead. And the customs, the law had said, king should receive proper burial. But I believe that there was some form of resentment in his heart. Though, you know, sometimes my friends, we can be so afraid of God that we do not kill our enemies. But we are so in love with ourselves that we cannot forgive them either. There are times you, you don't murder the person. You don't say anything bad about the person. That's the height of hypocrisy. When we have become skillful in, in hiding your true emotions, yet they are killing you inside. David was king. He was writing Psalms. And God saw exactly what was happening. And David was so sure of himself. David knew that he was serving God. But you cannot continue to serve God the way you want. And that's why the crisis came. Every time there's a crisis, there's a lesson behind it. And God first started with Saul because David, you know, God has a way to deal with David. He was such a sincere guy. He was so sometimes gullible. At the same time, he was, an, he was a fierce soldier. He would kill those who oppose him. He had a temper. David could hate. Can, have you read his Psalms? Break their teeth, cut their heads, walk over them, God. They, they, David had that anger issue. That's what happened to abuse people whose older brothers have abused. And David, and God is looking at David. And God wants David to understand his state of mind. He created the crisis. That's why it's important in all crises, there are lessons to be learned. So he had turned his back to the cadavers, to the bones of soul. He did not. He was making him pay for his mouth. Hmm. He never took the bones to bury him with his father. And when there is anger and hatred in your heart, they are what we call collateral damages. He, he left his good friend Jonathan to rot also. David wrote a song, the song of the bow. Then I understand you can write beautiful song for the dead. You can go to the funerals and present beautiful acknowledgments. But that does not negate the fact that you have hatred in your heart. In fact, at funerals, people lie a lot. So David wrote a, wrote a song. He said, how great you are, how great you are. But he did still, still, he did not bury them. And the bones were still alive in his heart. And when came the time, came the time to choose who to die, he even went and took seven of the same family. The David just like, whoo, David just like Saul was about to decimate the descendants of Saul, his enemy. Now, when you refuse to bury the bones of your enemies, you end up piling more bones. Instead of two were unburied, now he added seven more, not nine. So the Bible says, when David understood what was happening, David went and took the bones of Jonathan, of Saul, and the seven boys. And then he went there and buried them properly. And the Bible says here, after that, after that, God ended the famine in the land of Israel. Ooh. God, after he handled his enemies properly, God ended the famine in Israel. My friends, today, there are a few lessons I'd like to draw from this story before we finish. 
I'm thinking of Rispa. <laughs> no, let's go to David. Regardless how big you have become, if there are dead bones in your heart <laughs> that are still alive, God is telling you, can these bones die? It's time to let them go. <laughs> Think of Rispa. Rispa, the, the, the mother of the two boys, <laughs> Rispa decided to sit by the cadavers for months. Then I see that maybe there is what you call the Rispa model. We have the David model. Nowadays, they talk about models. The Rispa model are the model of those who spend their lives cherishing the wounds of the past, sitting by the cadavers of their loved ones, sitting by the wounds of those who hurt you in your own wounds. And when you sit too, too, too much near cadavers, you end up smelling like cadavers. When, when, when the hurts and the wounds are still alive in you, you contaminate those around you. And whisper, when you are too close to your wounds and to the cadavers of the past, you become unavailable. Rispa left his home. There are so many people who are unavailable to their wives, to their husband, to their church, because they are sitting so close to the cadavers of the past. They cannot offer anything. When they open their mouth, it's only wounds and hurts. And here comes Rispa. She's sitting there. She's sitting there. Do you know, when you sit too close to cadavers, you become contaminated as well. And when you are contaminated, there are those contaminations, listen to me very carefully, that no mask, no gloves, no hand sanitizers, <laughs> no face shield <laughs> can protect you from catching. <laughs> the contamination of the heart cannot be protected with masks and gloves and shields. And that's what happened to Rispa. She was contaminated. And so was David. My friends, my, my question to you today, can these bones die? Can these bones die? David had to bury the bones. But you know, the devil is an expert at mimicking God. While in Ezekiel, God told Ezekiel, can these bones live? I think the devil went to David and speaks to us also by telling us, yes, these bones can live. But, the, but to live, <laughs> any living thing that does not give life is death, though they may seem to be alive. <laughs> David, the, the devil, let's go, has managed to keep the bones alive in David's life. And likewise, all of us, the reason why there are famines in our lives, spiritually, emotionally, we cannot love our wives properly. We cannot be a vital member in the community. The reason why we have so many gangs in our land. So why do we have so many crimes, black on black crimes, white on black crimes all over the world? So many bonds are still alive. The devil is telling you, yes, let them live in you. Let them live in you. And God told David implicitly, these bonds must die. And during the crisis, during the pandemic, I'd like to ask you today, um, what will, are you benefiting from it? May I invite you to search into yourself and ask yourself, can these bones 
die. And I can tell you they have to die. You see, the expression of social distancing this pandemic, you know, it's not new to us. We have been social distancing for the longer swell. We have created social distancing between our classes, between nations. Within our church, we have groups. We have the have and the have nots, the educated, the uneducated. So this question of social distancing, tell the White House, tell CDC, we've been doing it long time ago. The devil has managed to create social distancing between God's children. So now that now we see the ugliness of it in real life. <laughs> we see how people are hurt. There's a girl who told me that she went to a mother's house. She knocked. The mother said, go home. I don't want to see you. We are 75. You're, gonna, you're coming to kill us, honey. Talk to us on the phone. You see people in a distance. People feel rejected. When people are quarantined, they go crazy. People have been feeling like that all along through our social distancing that we've done through our classes, our groups, our cliques. When we go back to our churches, to our job, to our work, we'll understand that we have been doing it a long time ago and the danger of it, how people get hurt during, during the famine or during this pandemic, there's much to learn. My friends, my question now, why did God call David at that time to solve that issue? Hmm. You know why? Because we are not fighting against flesh and blood. Hmm. <laughs> We're not fighting against flesh and blood. We are fighting <laughs> against principalities and powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against wicked and evil spirit in high places. Why did God tell David to be healed? You know why? I mean, when I discovered that, I was shocked. Stay with me. Stay with me. Why did God tell David, it's time for you to change? You cannot remain with those dead bones in your heart. You cannot remain with the hatred. You cannot remain with that sea thing of revenge. Though you wrote so many psalms about, about, about Saul, how God saved you. My friends, I believe even if God has saved you from your enemies, but I'm wondering if God can save your enemies from you. Because when you're hiding there, hiding there, but why did God choose that moment to reveal such a deep-seated issue in his heart? God went to a back road. The same thing that, God, that, that Nathan did by making David condemn the guy who stole the sheep of the poor shepherd. God had David to stand and say, yeah, what Saul did was wrong. Kill his family. God was at the same time revealing to him the depravity of his own soul. Because we can be so consumed with ourselves, with our knowledge, with our doctrine, with our church, with the length of time we be at church, that we forget to see the stench in our own hearts. So why did God tell David to do it right there? You know why? When I read it, I was shocked. What happened is verses 15 to 17, 2 Samuel 21, 15 to 17. Listen to that. After David buried the bones, once again, the Philistines were at war with Israel. Now, there is a great controversy. That war that goes on and on and on and on and on. Remember, David came on the scene when he killed Goliath the Philistine. Years after the Philistines are still there because the war never ends. Satan never leave you alone. You know that. And the Bible said, and when David and his men were in the thick of battle, David became weak and exhausted. 
There is a moment in life. There is a moment in life. The strength of the past may not use you for the battle of the present. And God, in his knowledge, knew something was going to happen to David. In order for him to save David from his enemies, he had to save David from himself first. There are deliverances before they come, you have to be delivered from yourself. When God delivers you from your enemies while you're still enslaved by yourself, the blessing becomes a curse for you. You become more arrogant, you become more haughty, you become more cocky, and you become more dangerous for your surroundings. So God had to tell David, clean your life, clean yourself. He created a crisis. I believe, my friends, we were so involved in church. We were doing so many things, we forgot to take care of ourselves. We forgot to juxtapose our lives with what God really asked us to do. We became so church people. We became so committee members people. We became so subcommittee members people. We, have, we could have become evil, mistreating each other as nothing. Once I got the vote, once I got my friends, and that's it. The communities, the Christian communities, have become cesspool of the devil. Where people fight for position, people fight for so many things, and names are called divorce, separation, people just hurting each other. But the, the whole thing is going. God stopped it. Stop you? Stop all the churches. Stop the White House. Stop the nations of the earth to make them sit and ask, what's wrong with us? My friends, that's why. I want to tell you, God knew something was happening because when David became weak, verse 16, listen to that. Ishi Benob. That's a name, strange name. Ishi Benob. People can say, Ishi Benob. Or to make reference on Ishbi, Ishbi Benob, was a descendant of the giants. Did you hear that? In verse 15, 16 was a descendant of the giants. This guy, that guy was Goliath's grandchild. He says here, his bronze spearhead with more than eight pounds, just the head. And he was armed with a new sword. Huh? I don't know why the Bible explained that. The kid had been trained to kill David. He was trained to kill David. The Bible said he had a new weapon to kill David. He said he was, he had cornered David and was about to kill him. Have you, have you ever read that thing in the Bible? Goliath's grandchild had returned for David. And he was trained for it. That's why. So God knowing that David was going to be cornered. God knowing that it was time for David to get his life together. Because the enemy was preparing for him. That's the advantage we have over our enemies. God knows the plans of the enemies. And through the word of prophecy tells us what's going to happen. So he had David. He sent a plague. He sent a, a pandemic for David to sit and analyze his ways and correct his ways. David was weak in battle and Ishbi Benob cornered David. All heaven was watching on that day. David is about to die. Killed by the giant. When we, you mess up with the devil, the people you killed in the past will always return to kill you in return. Because they never forgive you. You who has chosen, you have chosen to be with God. The devil knows you. He's preparing thoughts for you. The church of God that has won many battles of the devil. The devil is coming after you. For the dragon is angry against the woman. 
and he's coming back. And this pandemic has called the church to make an assessment of our hearts. To ask ourselves, are we really loving each other? Because that's the commitment of God. To love God above all in our neighbors as ourselves. But the devil is preaching. I believe that the last temptation of the church is when the devil decides to misquote Ezekiel 37.3, just like he did in the desert of temptation of Jesus in Psalm 91. He's telling the church, yes, these bones can live. But we don't know what bones he's talking about. And God is saying they must die. <laughs> David was about to die. But since his life was okay with God, Abishai, son of Zeruah, came to his rescue and killed the Philistine. Wow. David could not kill the giant. He killed the father, but he could not kill the son. Hmm. Hmm. The, his community stood with him and killed. I hope you can draw some conclusion from that. You know, as a church, you know why we need to get our acts together? Because the sixth seal, the seventh seal will soon come. The seventh trumpet, seventh trumpet, huh. the seven plagues, the beast is coming. Hmm. The image of the beast will be manifested. Evil men in darkness are preparing all kinds of issues for us. The, the devil is coming after us and he has prepared special things for our extermination. It is high time to start digging the bones in our hearts. You cannot continue to hate your father like that. You can continue to just be angry at your mom. You can continue to hate your former husband. You can continue to cause your children to hate their dad. You cannot continue to just creating social distancing because of your degrees because of the country you came from, because of the size of your islands. You cannot continue to behave as if uh, things were okay when in fact that you are destroying God's people. You have so many bonds in your heart. You, you, you have not forgiven. You cannot continue to live like that. The beast is coming. The beast is coming. The beast is here. Do you understand as Seventh-day Adventists, the prophecies of the Revelation and Daniel, they are gonna come to pass. So God used this pandemic to sit you down to tell you that the church is not those should not be the primary reason you serve God. You serve must serve God because of what Jesus Christ has done for you and what Christ can do for you. This this is a blessing of the pandemic that your church is no longer the podium at two thirty South Columbus. Your church should be in your heart. You are the temple of the living God. My friends, as we come to an end, I like to tell you, the word is spoken. Can these bones die? In the name of God, you must stand and say, I may not be able to kill them myself, huh? but it's time by the help of God, help me to bury them because the Ishbi <laughs> is Bibanab, the son of a giant, <laughs> the guy who got who got embarrassed on the cross. The devil is sending spirits from hell against you, against me, against our children. The only way we can find true protection is to submit to the rules of God, to the law of God, to the offer of God. Bury the bonds. Don't believe that the bones must live. It's only in Ezekiel 37, 3 that the bones could live because God gave, put his spirit in them. But when the devil put his spirit in the bones in your life, you become a devil with bow tie. Huh? You become a vicious husband. You become a vicious president. 
You become a vicious individual. That's when you kill immigrants. But what I like the most, my friends, you understand, when God is on your side, who can be against you? So I thank God for Jesus Christ, who on the cross of Calvary, that's the first word of Christ, when the devil attempted to put a lot of bonds in his heart to make him hate his, <laughs> the perpetrator of crime against his body. He did not fall for it. He did not keep the hatred in his heart. He looked and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus Christ left, left of an example and asked us, <laughs> bury the bonds, forgive them. Forgive the church members who did not say hello to you. For three years, you didn't talk because somebody did not say hello. The guy who raped you, the husband you stole your money, the children who embarrass you, <clears throat> the government who abuse you, the president who called your country <laughs> a blank hole. <laughs> the police officer who murdered your child. <laughs> the supervisor who fired you unjustly. Everybody, if there are bones in your heart, the devil is telling you, keep them alive, keep them alive. That excitement. And God is asking you, can this bone die? Please say yes. Kill them for me. Take them away. Jesus did. And because of his choice, he gave life to you so that our dead bodies can be living temple for God. As the elect of God, as Colossians 3 said, let your whole being be filled with compassion and love and kindness and gentleness and forgiveness. When we return back to church, let us love each other. Let us not look at that clothes, at shirt, at the hair, at the glasses, at the, at the education. Let's go deeper. Let's just embrace each other. We cannot go back to do the same or to be the same. Let's go back with buried bonds ready to fight the Ishbi Benab who will be coming and be ready to fight for our brothers who are weak. When the community stands together in love, we kill all the children of the giants that will come. We will fight and we will win because Christ won. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we stand broken. We have written many songs while there were still dead bones in our lives. We've preached many sermons while we hated those who hurt us. We have spoken great words at funerals about the dead when in fact that in our hearts we hold so many bad feelings toward them. We have created social distancing even before the CDC created that expression. The stench of our lives are there. The contamination is spreading. The hatred, the resentment, the blind nationalism, whether it's America or the islands, the pride of our nations and our history, they all are killing us, causing us to mistreat each other, disrespecting each other, looking down on each other, though we all share the same belief, oh God, we are a big mess, big time hypocrites. Thank you for this pandemic. I say thank you. Thank you for having shut down our churches so that we can make an assessment of our lives. May the wife, the wounded wife, the wounded husband, the wounded child, the wounded nephew, the wounded citizen find healing in you because you are the healer. Because if you fight for us, we will win. 
Father in heaven, you have clearly demonstrated to us the battle is not our battle. The war is not our war. It's yours. And victory is already <laughs> secured in Jesus Christ. Help us to come to you in love, in, in kindness, in humility. And may when we return to church, we will embrace each other with deep Christian love, having buried all our bones and now living, living, living with the Holy Spirit of the Lord in our hearts. Bless us and keep us safely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If there is anyone at this time who would like to give his or her life to God, please listen to the message on the screen. Do not leave the site. I'd like you to remain. I'd like you to turn to God. By the way, if there's anyone in his heart or her heart who needs healing, you can check with a professional. Make an assessment during this next days. Make some phone calls. As you leave today, may I tell you, yes, these bonds can die in Jesus. Amen.